one, two, lovely. And just to say our Easter Sunday morning service, a normal time, and uh, our, our children will be singing, the children's choir will be singing, and all sorts of other exciting things happening on Easter Sunday morning, and then Sunday evening as well. Just a brief meditation, okay? We're not here for a, drastic long t- a drastically long time. Can I just ask you to look at the curtains? The curtains are lovely, aren't they? Oh, yeah, you've just said, oh, didn't see them. Does anybody know it's got a new carpet as well? You, did, you, did you notice that, did you? Oh, um, yeah. New curtains, the new carpet. <laughs> oh, I didn't notice them, they said. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Why the cross? Just a meditation on the cross. That's Good Friday now, and we're just thinking of the cost involved in our salvation. Why did Jesus die? Forgive me for stating something that's fairly obvious, but I'm going to say it anyway. The cross was an instrument of death, and I'm saying that initially because, of course, it's become a decorative symbol to us, and, and there's nothing wrong with wearing a cross around your neck or having one on your wall if that, if that pleases you. But you'll understand that as a church, we do not believe that we need any outward symbol to recognize what Jesus has done for us. And though it may be decorative, it may be an ornament, but the cross was an, or, uh, an instrument of death. And Jesus chose to die. Let's just, just highlight a couple of things before we get into some simple principles about the cross. He's the only person who chose to die in this way. He left heaven's glory. We sing about heaven, or we should sing about heaven, but he's the only one who chose to be born and knew how he was going to die. As Paul quite, quite rightly said when he was reading Isaiah 53, Jesus knew the Old Testament more than any because he was the one who inspired the writing of it, along with his father. He knew exactly what was going to happen when he stepped onto this earth. A third of the Gospels is all about the death of the Lord Jesus. And some may say, well, why would that be the case? When you look at the balance of his birth and then his baptism and then his life, you see that there's a great overbalance, as it were, on the death of the Lord Jesus. Then when you come to the Apostles' Creed, the the doctrines of the church, they major on the death of the Lord Jesus. And as again we've been reminded this evening as we've uh, shared communion, Jesus told us to remember him, not by what he said, not by what he did, though those are good things. He told us to remember him by how he died and why he died. So why did Christ die? Was it just as an example Yes, of course it was an example, but there was far more. That's not enough just to say that Jesus died to give us a a good example. Was it an exhibition to show God's love? And yes, the cross is all about showing God's love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shouldn't perish but have everlasting life. If you've come to church tonight on a good Friday because it's the thing to do at Easter, and you haven't found the love of Christ in your life, then there's no reason tonight why you couldn't find that. But it's more than an example. It's more than an exhibition. If you wanted one text, that uh, there's many texts, but one text that would, in in my mind, outline what this is all about, I'd find it in 1 Corinthians 15 and 3, and it says this, Christ died for our sins according, in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day, He goes on to talk a lot more about that. But let's just say that Christ, the reason that the cross is there, the reason that Christ died is that he died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. Folks, we would not have forgiveness for sins in any other way except through the cross. There is salvation in no other name except the name of Jesus. And though it sounds like we're a little bit big-headed and bigoted, we have to simply say this. That whatever the religions of this world might tell you, there's, there's salvation in no other name because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And the thing about Jesus is not his good example and the nice words that he said. And all the great philosophers will tell us that he was the greatest of the thinkers of our world. But the reason we can say salvation is in Jesus is because he died on a cross. So what happened on that Easter Sunday? Well, we know what happened on the Easter Sunday. He rose from the dead. But what happened on the Good Friday when he died? What is the cross all about? And I'm going to just spend these few moments that I'm just sharing here this evening on this Good Friday talking about five meanings of the cross. 
Now, this isn't a sermon that will get you whipped, out, whipped up and excited, but I think it's absolutely important if we are Christians here this evening that we understand that without what happened on the cross, we would not have any basis of faith. Let me start by telling you this. The five meanings of the cross. The first is quite simply that the cross means the supreme conquest over the devil. How many find that's good news? Because Jesus has died on a cross and then rose from the dead, then we no longer have to fear the evil one. There's a lovely verse which I'll turn your attention to, and I'll just give you a verse on each one of these five points. In Hebrews 2 and 14, it says, Jesus shared our humanity so that by his death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil. Let me tell you, folks, it's not Jesus' good words, however wonderful they are. It's the fact that he conquered death on the cross that we have victory over the devil. And you this evening, and for the rest of your spiritual lives before you step into heaven, can know the confidence that, that the devil has been, has been beaten. Who's glad about that? That this Easter, we can confidently stand up and say, because Jesus died on a cross and then was resurrected, I no longer need to fear the, the attack of the evil one. Now, I want to tell you, the evil one is active. He's more active now than I believe he's ever been because he knows his time is short. He knows that Jesus is going to return again. He knows that he can, if he can, destroy the joy of the Christians. He can't steal your salvation, I don't believe, but let me tell you this. He can try and wreck your spiritual walk. But greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And that we can be more than conquerors through Christ. And it isn't because we're good. It isn't because of anything of ourselves. It's because of Jesus dying on a cross. The very fact that he's died and risen from the dead means that Satan no longer has power or dominion over us. And Satan has no dominion over us. And we are more than conquerors through Christ. Through the Christ who died and rose again. So that's great news to start with. There's four other great bits of news I'm going to give you now, but let me start off by saying that you can walk tall in God this evening because Jesus died on that Good Friday. The supreme conquest over the devil. Point number two, because Jesus died on a cross, he brought about successful reconciliation for the world. Successful reconciliation. What does that word reconciliation mean? I've given you a couple of short definitions for it here. To render no longer opposed. Before we came to Christ and before Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected, there was an opposition between us and God because sin had entered the world. But now we find that he's no longer opposed to us once we've given our lives to this Jesus. To win over to friendliness, to bring into agreement or harmony. This reconciliation happened when Jesus died on a cross. He reached one hand out to the Father and one hand out to humanity as he hung on the cross and he brought both of them together. Let me give you a verse to confirm this to you. Colossians 1 verses 19 to 20, 22. I haven't given you all of that text there, but it simply says this, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus and through him to reconcile, that is to bring together in agreement and harmony, to render no longer opposed, to reconcile himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Folks, when Jesus died on the cross, his blood was shed. He was bringing us back into harmony, into reconciliation, into relationship with the Father. Now, I need to underline how important that is. You'll never understand how important that is until you realize what sin did when, when sin entered the world. It caused a barrier. It caused a division. It caused a vast separation between humanity, the whole of humanity. And however good we were, however many bridges we tried to build over that chasm of sin, we tried to be good and it didn't work. The bridge didn't go far, far enough. We tried to be religious, and the bridge of religion didn't reach the Father. We tried good works, and we tried prayer. We tried all sorts of things to try and get back to God, but there was this chasm of sin. The only way that we can be reconciled to the Father is coming to the foot of the cross and saying, Jesus, your blood has made it possible for me to have a relationship with the Father. 
The third thing, number one, it's the supreme conquest over the devil, and that was one at the cross. Number two, he has successfully brought us back into relationship, reconciled us uh, to the Father. Number three, the sufficient offering for sin. Now, folks, we need to be very clear that the, the death of our Lord Jesus Christ was paying a price that could be paid in no other way. Let me give you one verse among many that talks about this, Romans 3.23. It says there, God presented Jesus as a sacrifice of atonement. And I've put in brackets there because I want to try and explain, and I will explain what this atonement means in a little while, to make amends or reparation through faith in his blood. Now, what is this first talking about? God presented Jesus as a sacrifice of atonement to make amends or reparation through faith in his blood. Somebody had to pay the price for sin. Somebody had to take the rap. Somebody had to, and it would be us if Jesus hadn't have uh, died on the cross, somebody had to pay the penalty. Because if God is a just God, he cannot turn a blind eye to sin. He cannot say, well, I'll let you get away with it. Somewhere along the line, an offering has to be made for sin. This word atonement that's in this particular verse comes out in different ways, in different versions. The word atonement, the the reconciliation of God and man by Christ... I've put down there, at one moment, he wants to make me at one with him. And that can only be done by somebody paying the price for my sin. Forgive this little bit of theology here, but I'm not afraid of that. In the authorized version, that, this is the NIV that we've read up here, that he has uh, made a sacrifice of atonement. In the authorized version, or, or the RSV, there's two other words that are used. And the modern language, the modern versions try and uh, avoid such technical terms. But they say God put forward Jesus as, number one, an expiation. You'll find that in the RSV. Or a propitiation by his blood. Now, it's little wonder that the NIV and modern versions try and avoid those words because they're difficult theological words. But basically, those words are telling us that somewhere down the line, a God who was angry with sin had to be appeased by some sacrifice. Now, this isn't very popular now. In fact, I would go further to say that there are some folks who try to rule out this concept of God being angry over sin. But I want to tell you that there's a God in heaven who looks down on a perfect creation that he has made and sees that we have devastated this world, and more to the point, not just devastated the world, but devastated human beings, and he got angry with us. And he says he's going to have to punish, the, punish us. And therefore, a propitiation, an appeasement that had to be made because God was angry, had somewhere or other had to happen. As I was driving the church this evening, I listened to the news avidly from Radio 4, and they tell me that there's just been this great com, uh, conference of great scientists who've now come to the absolute 100% conclusion that human beings are causing global warming, which is going to cause us a great deal of trouble in the future. Now, there's God who's made a perfect world, a perfect environment for his greatest creation, which is human beings. And he looks down and he sees human beings are wrecking it. Now, personally, during this nice little bit of warm spell, my wife has made me go out into the garden. Now, as it happens, she didn't actually force me because I like gardening. But can you imagine if you created a beautiful garden with lovely flowers, and unfortunately, I'm, the story I'm just about to tell is quite true, that in some public places, beautiful gardens have been laid out, and then vandals have come along and ruined the garden. I just read in the paper the other week where somebody has gone along with snippers and cut down all the daffodil heads in this... Did anybody hear that bit of news, read that little bit of news? Some of you are nodding. Some vandals come along and cut all the daffodils down in some particular area in Great Britain. Now, can you imagine if you were the gardener, you spent time and effort in creating this beautiful garden and some vandal has come and wrecked it. You blokes, let me give you another example, okay? Supposing you just bought a nice shiny car. Beautiful, nice shiny car. And then somebody comes along and decides that he's going to scratch it and wreck it for you. 
How many know that some of us blokes might just get to be a little, little bit upset about that? All right, just a little bit, okay. We, you know, we're not into materialism, I know, but we would get upset about it. Let me tell you this, there's a God in heaven who's seen a beautiful creation that he has brought about and human beings have wrecked it. But let me tell you this, he's far more upset about something else. He's, I believe he's upset about global warming. I believe he's upset about the ecology of the world. I believe he's upset about the way that we are spoiling the creation. But let me tell you this, he's far more upset about the fact that we have spoilt his greatest creation. And he brought about some beautiful relationship between a man and a woman, and a man and his God, and a woman and her God. And the devil has come and robbed us and stolen and caused those relationships to be so spoiled. I believe God grieves over that. He gets angry. He gets angry over every child that is badly treated. He gets angry over every human relationship that's been spoilt because of our greed and our anger and our bitterness and our jealousy. And is it little wonder that there's going to be the need for these long-sounding words that God is going to have to do something? He's going to get angry, and so therefore there's going to be a need for a propitiation against sin. Somebody's got to pay the price. I want to tell you, if, if Jesus hadn't paid the price, Jesus, God will be looking down with great anger at the sin of every human being, and every human being has sinned. But thank God, the wrath of God is no longer poured out on me as a human being because when God stepped into humanity through His Son, the Lord Jesus, He knew, as we've already heard mentioned, that at some stage or other, God was going to have to turn His face from Jesus because all His wrath was poured on Jesus on the cross. Jesus became the sufficient offering for our sin, the propitiation, the expiation for our sin, the atonement to bring us one, one back to God. Number, is this number four? You see, God had written in the law, satisfaction was needed for the law. Somewhere along the line, the law of God had to be fulfilled. Now, I'm not proud about this, but I want to tell you in my youth, before I was a Christian, I broke the law. I come from a family of breaking the law. I have a brother who's in prison now having broken the law. I would be embarrassed to tell you for the reasons he's been in prison and out of prison all his life. But I broke the law. I grew up in the east end of London, um, and uh, we learned how to steal. I remember the first thing I stole was an orange from, a, from a, a fruit seller as I walked past, and that led from one thing to another. And I'm not proud about the fact that I was breaking into people's houses before I became a Christian. I did stand in front of a judge, and this illustration that I'm just about to give you isn't my illustration, but supposing it had been me, and supposing the judge had found me guilty, as I was guilty, and supposing the, the, uh, the punishment for my guilt had to be a, a check that had to be signed, and the judge was to say, yes, you're guilty, somebody's got to pay the price of that, that guilt and that... that uh, uh, misdemeanor that you've done, and supposing it was a thousand pounds, but in his mercy, he said, listen, someone has got to pay this thousand pounds, and you know the illustration, the judge gets his checkbook out of his pocket, and he writes a thousand pounds, paid to the, the clerk of the court, he doesn't hand it to me, he hands it to the clerk of the court, because he's paying my fine, listen, God has to be true to himself, and the law had to be fulfilled. Look at this verse that we just re revealed in Romans 8, 1 to 3. A beautiful verse. It says there, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, condemned by the judge of the universe, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. When I read this book and I saw that I shouldn't do certain things, the law of sin in me, actually, it just almost condemned me straight away. When I was a young person and I saw the sign, keep out, guess what it said to me? It says, if it says keep out, I'm going in. Because the law was condemning me. 
But I want to tell you now that what the law could not do because of my sinful nature, Jesus has done by dying on the cross. And he set me free from my sinful nature. He's no longer condemning me. Therefore, there is, therefore there, there is now no condemnation. And I want to tell you, many, many Christians haven't grasped the fact that God has set us free from the law. So that they walk through life condemned because the devil is saying you're a failure. The devil's saying you're a sinner. The devil's saying, you, yes, you you've go to church, but you're no longer what you should be. And they live oppressed because they haven't been set free. Not recognizing that Jesus has set us free. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And it all happened on the cross. That Jesus fulfilled the law perfectly. Because no human being up until that stage and no human being since have ever fulfilled the law. It's only by the grace of the Lord Jesus. So the, the cross means to me the supreme conquest over the devil. It means successful reconciliation and bringing back together with God and man. Sufficient offering for the sin. Somebody had to pay the price. Satisfaction for the law. And then of course... All of these are wrapped up in the same kind of words, but we'll just give you the last thought anyway. The substitution for our penalty. We talk about the substitutional, substitutional death of the Lord Jesus. He became our scapegoat. Do you know what a scapegoat was? Many of you do. You know that in the Old Testament, the way that they, ha they, could, they had to deal with the sin of the community is that they had to sacrifice animals. And for the sin of Israel, once a year, they would bring a goat into the, into, the, into the community. And it was called the scapegoat. Certainly in the wilderness, when they were wandering around in the wilderness, they'd bring this scapegoat, and the priest would lay hands on the goat, representing the, the community, and the, representing the sin of the community, and laying the sin on that scapegoat. And then it would be set free. In other situations where animals were brought, if you came to church in those days, you had to bring a sacrifice and you had to, that, your sin was represented in that animal and that animal had to be sacrificed. And Paul read earlier on from Isaiah 53 and verse 5, this lovely, lovely verse, that Jesus was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. goes on to say, Surely he bore my sorrows, and by his stripes we are healed. The sin of human beings was laid upon Jesus, the scapegoat, and released because Jesus was the substitution for my sin, paid the penalty. Yes, he was sufficient offering. Yes, he was successful recon rec success successfully reconciling the world. But he was a satisfaction for the law, and he was a substitution. The truth is we should all have been there on the cross. We should all have been there. But Jesus did it for me. I want to tell you, folks, there are no shortcuts. There are no quick fixes. I know that it's possible to come into a church like ours and by osmosis, do you know what osmosis, anybody remember your geography or your, your, your biology lessons and osmosis where, where a, a strong solution affected a weak solution? I know some folks can come into church and by osmosis it can creep up on you and you can do everything that Christians are doing around you. They're raising their hands, and so you raise your hands. They're looking happy in church, so you're happy in church. And by osmosis, you're picking up the atmosphere, and you're saying, oh, this is good. I like this Christian atmosphere. But I want to tell you, unless you've come to the cross and confessed your sins, there is salvation in no other way. Because one day, we're going to stand before our uh, a, a judge who is called God and a judge who is called Jesus, and we're going to say, and Jesus can ask us, why should I let you into my heaven? You say, oh, well, I went to BCC and I sang the songs and I, was, oh, I did everything else that everyone else should be doing. And God says, well, did you ever confess your sin? Did you ever come to the cross? Did you ever do something about what my son did on the cross for you? It's not whether we've by osmosis slipped into whatever all the Christians around us. 
I'm almost reticent to use this humorous, il humorous illustration, which I've used before now, but there is a, a real element of truth to this, though it is a slightly exaggerated. I tell you, told you before now, of when I was in my first church in Ilkeston, the truth of the matter is that I went to visit a, a, a lady in the, in the church, an older lady, and she went to make me a cup of tea, as she normally did, and uh, in, uh, in her front room, I realized that there was a Christian in that front room because I heard a hallelujah, praise the Lord. I knew that must be a Christian because anybody who says hallelujah and praise the Lord is a Christian, surely. I looked around and here's the exaggeration behind the settee and whatever, no Christian there. And there it is, the bird in the corner, <laughs> in the cage, saying hallelujah, praise the Lord. Now it wasn't a, um, it wasn't, a, a, what we're, what we're, not a parrot, what's the other one that you can, uh, that's right, a pigeon, there it is, there it's in the corner there. And, um, and it's saying, hallelujah, praise the Lord. In fact, it was a Pentecostal because it was raising its wings. <laughs> Exaggeration. In fact, it might have been a charismatic house church because it was dancing on the perch. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. <laughs> Folks, I tell you, you can go through whatever religious ritual you want to. In some churches, the priest will be wearing a robe and they'd have very sacramental things going on. And we would knock it as Pentecostals and we say, oh, well, that's just ritual. How many know that Pentecostals have got rituals as well? And we, can, we know exactly what's going to go on, to be very honest. And we can go through our Pentecostal rituals. We can go through our Church of England rituals or our Baptist rituals or our Catholic rituals. And we can do everything that we're supposed to do, but never come to the cross. The truth is we've got to repent of our sins. We've got to come to the cross and recognize that what Jesus did there, that is the whole point of this stuff. And I want to challenge you on this Good Friday, and we're going to sing a final song to conclude. Have you come to the cross? Do you know that the devil has been conquered in your life because Jesus now lives in your life? Do you know that you've been brought back into a relationship with God the Father simply because you've submitted to Jesus and all that he did on the cross for you? Do you understand that your sin has been dealt completely with? Sufficient offering. The law has been satisfied, so you're not walking in condemnation. You know that if you sin, you confess your sin. He's faithful and just to forgive your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You know that he took your place. He took, you, he took your place. Thank you for saving me. That's a good line for the musicians to come up here. Folks, if you haven't come to the cross, there's no, no reason why you shouldn't. However religious you may be, however faithful to church you may be, it's not whether you're faithful to church. As I very often say, it's not whether you've come to church the issue, it's whether you come to Jesus. And how many know you can come to church very, very regularly and never come to Jesus? Lord, please deliver me from religion. Help me to get a good dose. Billy Graham says, the problem with Great Britain when he came in, you've been inoculated with a little dose of religion and it keeps you from the real thing. That's Billy Graham. He says, we've had so much of a little taste of religion that it's keeping us from the real thing. And the real thing is coming to the foot of the cross.